Hey, Stephen Young here at Burneson Auto Wrecking in the junkyard crawl in Burneson, Massachusetts with the story of the Cadillac LaSalle Two, also known as the Buick Riviera. Now, you older hot rodders will remember that 1939 and 40 Cadillac LaSalle grills were used by customizers of like 36 Fords and stuff. It looked a lot like this. This grill form would be used in the front of a Ford hot rod, and it was a cool thing to have a LaSalle grill. Well, the Riviera, before it was known as the Riviera, was actually going to be a Cadillac junior model called the LaSalle II. And in fact, again, here is the styling touch of the LaSalle, keeping it absolutely in the Cadillac family. But here's the thing. Around 1961, Cadillac apparently vetoed the notion of a junior level Cadillac. Buick says, you know, we'll take that. And it was also known as the Project XP715. Now we all know, of course, 1963, the Buick Riviera launched into the world. Basically, Buick's answer to the 58 Ford Thunderbird, the first personal luxury car with four seats. And the Riviera did a great job of emulating the Thunderbird and taking it several steps forward. Now, now this is the June 64 issue of Car Life magazine right here. And try to ignore the GTO on the cover for the moment. That's another story for another time. But inside of this is a story on the gestation of the LaSalle 2 slash XP715 slash Riviera. We can see here all the, the styling uh, clays that were done steps along the way. And check out the grills. We can see that prominent uh, right and left hand side. We see those prow like grills that are again just all about the 1939 40 LaSalle grill. And on the next page, we have here Bill Mitchell, of course. Bill Mitchell was the head of GM Styling at the time. Here is his personal car. This was called the Silver Arrow. Certainly a nod to the Pierce Arrow Silver Arrow custom car. But see the headlights on that, how they're in the ends of the fenders? Well, 1965, the Riviera finally got those clamshell headlights. And again, the Silver Arrow, I think, still lives. But this is Bill Mitchell's personal hot rod that was made for him at General Motors back in 1960, late 62, early 63. Now, this is a 64 Riviera, the second of the breed. And it does have the centrally located headlamps. Again, 65 would bring the clamshells for the final year of the first gen Riviera, but this is a great example of General Motors styling really at, at the peak. No plastic here. This is all die cast metal, this egg crate grill, the bumper, arrogant, proud. And again, this was Buick's statement of pure luxury. The sticker price on this back in 64 was $4,385. This was $133 more than a Stingray Coupe. So if you bought a Riviera, you could have bought a Corvette. But again, these were cars that bankers and you know wealthy housewives, that sort of thing, enjoyed. Uh, and, and enjoy they did. Under the hood, always a V8, of course. 1963, the 401 Nailhead, 64, the 425. And this is it right here. Now, the 425 made 340 horsepower, but for an additional 188 Eight bucks, you could get the dual quad W5 engine, which made 360 horsepower. But there's that Carter AFB four barrel. This one is an air conditioning car, I believe. No, no AC. Okay, kind of weird. But again, the alternator in its second year, 1963 first year for alternators replacing generators. And again, the nail head with these sort of horizontally located valve covers first appeared in 1953. It was made famous by drag racers like Tommy Ivo, and the nail head kind of had smallish valve sizes and ports that accelerated the uh, the mixture for velocity. So these were really about torque, not so much horsepower. But again, the nail head, a great engine. Here it is here in 425 cubic inches, uh, and again, you know, nicely preserved under the hood. The rest of the car, well, maybe not so much, but you gotta love the factory gold paint. What a classy car this must have been when it was new. Now, this is no longer equipped with the front brakes, but these are the backing plates and shoes for the 12 inch aluminum drum brakes found on pretty much all Buick full-size cars from 59 through 70. And again, with the aluminum drum, the uh, dissipation of heat was superior to cast iron, and Buick brakes were some of the best drum brakes in the business until disc brakes really took over in 1969, 70 and beyond in full-size cars. Now we see here uh, the door, this is frameless door glass. Well, Riviera in 63 was the first American car mass produced with frameless door glass. Think about it. Most cars have a little bead of metal around the window that goes up and comes down with the door. Uh, that's standard stuff now. Well, in 63, Buick was first without that. And it gave the car a much cleaner look. Windows down, and even with the window up, it's just cleaner. But here's the thing. Look inside the door, and there's no big opening here for accessing 
the, the, the riser mechanism. So the Riviera was actually made with bolt-on door skin. One, two, three, four, and several more around the perimeter. Take these off, these studs, and the actual outside of the door comes off, the skin comes off, which then allows the installation of the glass and all of the riser mechanisms. So very unconventional construction. Most cars, the skin is part of the door structure. They're welded together and access comes from the inside. But again, the beauty of that is if you have a 63 through 65 Riviera and you get a fender bender or a door bender, I should say, the door skin unbolts for quick replacement. So a little side benefit there. Inside, center console on all Rivieras. No manual transmissions, unfortunately, uh, but dig the 140. 40 mile an hour speedometer and you know a general sporting flair. Bucket seats up front, tilt column on this one here. Again, 1964 was the first year for the tilt column right here, made by Saginaw Gear, a division of General Motors. And again, not available in 63, but again, for the first time right here in 64, the, the tilt column made life a little bit easier getting in and out. And again, a $43 well spent. Uh, just, you know, pretty upscale stuff inside, metal finishes on the uh, glove compartment. And one thing we can see kind of cool, these are body on frame, but instead of a perimeter frame, these have an X frame. And we can see right here with the exhaust pipe, these all have dual exhaust. Here, thanks to the Massachusetts X-ray vision, this is the exhaust pipe running from the driver's bank of the engine down the drive shaft tunnel. And here's the, uh, the X right there, part of the X frame right there, hiding underneath this factory lightweight floor pan. Joking. But yeah, rust has had its way with this poor car. But the beauty though, is that the Riviera really was um, a car ahead of its time, but was almost a Cadillac, a LaSalle too. Now this is one of, uh, oh, 511,000 Buicks sold in 1964. Of them, roughly one in 13 was a Riviera. Uh, the beauty of them is massive trunk, you know, the deck lid, open that up. It, it, uh, you can sneak about, what, six, 12 of your friends to the movies in this thing. And again, we see the trunk floor on this thing is pretty well rotted out. Um, here's Fido's little bowl, nice. But uh, the original gold paint right there, you know, somehow that survived, but the rest of the car kind of diminished around it. But the fabric covering on the wheel housing, and uh, kind of interesting too, the uh, diagonal bolsters inside the body right here, which do a couple things. These help to ri maintain rigidity and uh, get rid of squeaks and rattles, but uh, also, you know, are somewhat uh, there for crashworthiness, but it's seldom to see an American production car with uh, structural members exposed like that in a trunk, usually like in a Mopar or a Chevy or something like that. There's no beam, but it all speaks to Buick's, um, you know, bank fault-like construction. Uh, and again, it was all about quietness. And, and the rear bumper on this thing, again, a, a thing of beauty. Basically, it looks like two bumpers, very arrogant, lots of chrome, reverse lights tucked into the center Nerf bar. And this one was equipped with a pretty heavy duty trailer uh, towing hitch right there. So this, this might have towed a horse trailer, or a house trailer, a couple of dune buggies. You just never know, cars don't talk. But the Buick Riviera lived on in many iterations, including a front wheel drive platform as you get into the 1980s and beyond. But the real Rivieras to most people are the ones built between 63 and 65 when they were based on the XP715 or Cadillac LaSalle. Too. Crazy but true, Cadillac almost owned the Riviera. But again, Bill Mitchell's styling staff came up with the idea. Buick people said, you know what, Cadillac, you don't want that, we'll take it. Interesting story, all true. Well, if you like this video and the story of the Buick Riviera first gen, well, stay tuned to the Steve Mag's YouTube channel. There's plenty more.